quite a mixed blessing to be able to introduce Katja. It's fantastic that um, we get the opportunity to display the great work that she has done in the last three years in my lab as a postdoc. But it's uh, very disappointing the fact that she'll be leaving us in, in a few months to return to Germany. So she's done such a spectacular job, both not only this project, which you'll, you'll see, but just uh, the technical development she has done, the fantastic person she has in the lab, the great questions that she asks, and uh, the discussions that we have about, uh, about immunology in general. It's been a real pleasure to, to have her working here. Um, she came, as I said, three years ago after finishing a PhD in, uh, in Hamburg at an Institute for Tropical Medicine, clearly saw the error of that particular pathway and came to work on, on, on B-cell biology, uh, which I think was a relatively steep learning curve for her uh, in the beginning, but once she's mastered, uh, mastered with, with great aplomb and skill, and you'll see some of the consequences of that uh, uh, in the talk. She came at a point where we were looking at this cytokine, the one in the title, R21, uh, but for its impact on B cells, something that Katya will cover in, in her introduction. And it came from uh, the studies that uh, Dimi was doing in her PhD thesis, which revealed this cytokine to be really crucial to, to the outcome of immunization, particularly in germinal centers and the nature of B cell memory. So we're particularly interested in, uh, in it. One of the consequences of that, of course, is that it meant we had to move into T cells, which I was rather uh, shocked to have to do after, whatever it is, 5,000 years now working on B cells. Um, and it was uh, beneficial that someone came with some T cell experience and at least uh, uh, an open mind, something that I had neither of. Um, <laughs> so, so it's going to be great to hear what uh, Katya has to say, although hopefully I know most of it. Uh, uh, and you get to hear her newfound enthusiasm and, uh, uh, for, for B cell immunology. And just one, one aside, the other enthusiasm that she has been able to indulge while here is in, uh, is in horse riding. Katja is actually quite an accomplished equestrian, so I'm not sure what brought her here, whether it was the B-cell immunology uh, or the horses. I, I like to think the, uh, the former. So Katja, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, okay, getting to the talk. So the title of today's talk is Following T-cell fate using an interleukin-21 reporter mouse. So today's talk, that means it's about C4 positive, so those MHC class 2 restricted T-cells. So this is just a naive CD4 cell, so a TH0 cell. But the body can be invaded by different kinds of pathogen, and then these cells can get activated. Um, so this different kind of pathogen can be diff yeah, of different kind. For example, uh, pathogens can live intracellularly like the most of the viruses, or they can live extracellularly like the most of the bacteria. And these CD4 T cells have now this large advantage that they can respond in different ways depending on the way, yeah, depending on how they need it, so the, way, the kind of the pathogen. So in that case, quite early, this um, Different subsets have been discovered, like the Th1 cells that are generated by intracellular viruses, or Th2 cells that are generated by extracellular pathogens. And these subsets are quite special in the way that they produce specialized cytokines that are <coughs> produced for the special need to uh, kill these pathogens. And to be able to have the specialized cytokine profile, they all rely on specialized transcription factors, so the master regulator of transcription that is always unique to the subset. So these are the first two subsets that have been discovered, but there are a lot of other circumstances under which CD4 positive T cells or activated CD4 positive T cells are needed. For example, if the body is invaded by helminths, or at sites of mucosal infection, or if they are infections at mucosal sites. Or on the other hand, all these um, activation also has to be balanced. So also there needs to be some cells for immune tolerance. So a lot of other subsets have been discovered in the last year. So this is not a fully picture, but for example, Th9 cells, Th17 or T-Rex cells have been discovered that all have the specialized profile of cytokines that they produce to deal with these infections, and they all rely on a specialized master regulator of transcription. But in this picture, we miss still one big function. Ah, oh, no, sorry, I'm too fast. Uh, first of all, together with all of these subsets, also some words have been defined, and these are the words yeah, that are coming together with C in the CD4 T cell biology. These are the words heterogeneity, terminal differentiation, plasticity and memory. 
So first of all, I would like to give a definition what these words mean. So what is heterogeneity in regard to a T cell? So heterogeneity means that there is the variety of cytokine protection profiles amongst the whole population of, yeah, amongst the whole population. So this is standing against the production of a fixed set of cytokines after the cell differentiation. So to give an example, um, if a cell has been activated and has been generated or differentiated into a Th1 cell, that means some of these Th1 cells are now producing interferon, interferon gamma, so the main effector cytokine of the Th1 cell. On the other hand, a few cells of this population can produce together with interferon gamma, also now IL-2, but they are still Th1 cells. And on the other hand, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of these cells now have to produce all cytokines they can at this very moment. So there can also be some Th1 cells found that don't produce interferon gamma at this moment. What means terminal differentiation? So terminal differentiation means that a cell can develop or progress through different activation status, but if it reaches one um, developmental step where it can't develop any further, so the only possibility once the end of the life has come to die, then this means the cell is terminal differentiation, as it can't differentiate into any other subset furthermore. In opposite to terminal differentiation, there's standing the word plasticity. And plasticity re means or reflects the cell's capability to switch from one lineage or subset to another subset or to a mixed phenotype. So that means if a Th0 cell has been differentiated, for example, in a Th17 cell, this cell still can give rise to or can develop further on to a Th1 cell. So that would mean these cells have plasticity. And as last, the word memory. So memory means that an experienced cell reverts to a quiescent state, but then this cell can uh, respond to its cognitive antigen in the case of re-encounter, so by proliferation and providing effector functions. Um, memory cells are divided at least into subgroups. So these are the T effector cells or the T central memory cells. They can be distinguished by the expression or non-expression of C62L or the expression of C62L, and the effector cells reside in non-lymphoid organs or tissues, whereas the central memory cells reside in lymphoid tissues. Coming back to all these functions that CD4 T cells can make. So in this picture, we have already a lot of functions like virus, bacteria, and worms, but one big function of CD4 T cells is still missing. So B cells need help to fulfill their full function. And CD4 cells are giving help to B cells. But now is the question, which CD, which CD4 T cell is giving help to a B cell? Okay. First of all, to give help, to be able to give help to a B cell, this T cell has to be in the right location. And this was already quite early clear that you can have T cells in B cell areas. So these are just some spleen sections. On the left hand, you can see a whole follicle. So the blue, standing in blue, are the B cell area. Then you have the T cell area in between. And here are areas that are stained by GL7. So this is depicting activated B cells. And then you can see that without the B cell area, especially inside these GL7 high areas, you have some green cells as T cells. And on the other hand, on the right hand, there is a Larger picture, again, all this area is now showing again an area of activated B cells, now divided in the, in the two functional subsets of this germinal center, light zone and dark zone. And then again, the green spots are the T cells. Then you can see that there are always T cells in, near, in close contact to B cells. So first of all, it was clear that a T cell to be able to give help to B cells must be in the right collocation. And already 15 or 20 years ago, CXR5 positive cells have been discovered. So CXR5 positive C4T cells have been discovered. And CXR5 is an important chemokine receptor that is mostly expressed on B cells, the home to B cell follicles. So first of all, these are the best candidates to give help to B cells. Within the last years, these cells have been further characterized and they have been, it has been shown that they show a high expression of a lot of co-stimulatory molecules like PD-1, BTLA, and ICOS. 
And additionally, these cytokines, uh, these T cells, uh, have been discovered to produce one important or one cytokine that was yeah, not familiar at that time point, that they produce IL-21. These in B-cell areas located T-cells produce the important cytokine IL-21. But so far to be to say, oh, is this now an activated state of one of the other T-cell subset, or is it a real subset on their own, was not clear since there was not a master regulator of transcription. But three years ago, there was the discovery um, of the master regulator of transcription, and these cells just can develop if BCL6 is present. So um, this is just a standing from someone out of our lab. It's gated on CD4 positive T cells in mixed bone marrow chimeras. And then you can see um, if these T cells miss B the transcription factor BCL6, then they can't upregulate CXR5 and no T follicular helper cells can be generated. So now we have the full picture of our, our T follicular helper cells. We have these necessary of the expression CXR5 of a lot of high expression of costumetry molecules, the secretion, the very important secretion of this vector cytokine, and the relying on the master regulator of transcription. So in our lab, we mostly characterize, just to, for, for the further talk, T follicular helper cells by being CXR5 and PD1 double high. Okay, so now we have a more fully picture of this CD4 T cell help. So we have now this function of T follicular helper cells that, give, that provide this very important help to B cells. Okay, getting into T follicular helper cell biology. So this just shows you, shows you if you first go to one, two, three, the TFH cell generation. So a T follicular helper cell is generated by getting activated by an antigen carrying activated dendritic cell. So this T cell is then upregulating CXR5 and is able to move into the B cell area where it can, has con can have contact with the B cell. And that means now it is secreting here interleukin 21. So um, what is interleukin 21? Interleukin 21 is yeah, mainly expressed by T follicular helper cells but under certain circumstances, it can also be expressed by TH17 cells or NKT cells. IL-21 binds to its receptor, and this receptor is built out of two parts. It's a specific IL-21 receptor chain and the common gamma chain. So it is a member of the common gamma chain cytokines, and this common gamma chain is shared by the IL receptor for IL-2, 4, 7, 9, and 15. This I21 receptor is mainly expressed on B cells and it is upregulated upon activation. The signaling is via the yak stat pathway and it uses mainly STAT3. So what is now the function of IL-21? So to the, on today's function, I want to concentrate on the regulation of T-cell-dependent immune responses. <coughs> but what is a T-cell-dependent immune response? The T-cell-dependent immune response can be separated into two phases. So first of all, the early T-cell-dependent response. Um, if a T-cell is getting activated, it, goes, it moves inside the T-cell area to the T-cell B-cell border. So T-cell area is shown again in green and the B-cell area in blue. Then um, this B-cell is getting activated and in this early phase, it is mainly producing extra follicular plasma cells. These extra uh, follicular plasma cells are fast generated and they produce antibodies that are fast available for the body to give a first um, defense against the pathogen. And so it is fast, but on the other hand, these antibodies have, have a low affinity. On the other hand, this B cell has a chance, has a, sh has a possibility to develop into a germinal center cell. And this germinal center cell is getting quite important in the late phase of the T cell dependent immune response. Now this germinal center cell with help of T follicular helper cell is proliferating and has then again two choices. So either it is giving rise to a plasma cell or it can give rise to a memory cell. Both of these cells, either the plasma cell as well as the memory cell, are now long-lived and they produce, or the plasma cell is producing antibodies with high affinity since uh, the germinal center cells go through the process of affinity maturation. 
And the memory cells also have now a B cell receptor with high affinity, and they, can, <coughs> yeah, they don't provide antibody at that moment, but they wait and build up the memory response. So what is now the function in these T cell dependent immune response of IL-21? Or with other words, does the loss of IL-21 have an impact on the B cell response? And this is a summary of Dimi's um, work in our lab. Um, she did show that, first of all, if you, if you don't have IL-21, then the extra follicular plasma cell formation is impaired. Uh, mainly that the maintenance of the germinal center cell proliferation is impaired. And this impairment of the proliferation leads in plasma cells and in memory cells with both low affinity. So that means that IL-21 is a soluble factor that regulates B cell responses. So coming back to our team, so now we are here at this point that T follicle hypercells produce IL-21 that acts on germinal center B cells. So if we don't have IL-21, then these cells can't proliferate, the numbers is getting reduced, and also the memory B cells and plasma cells are going pretty early out of the germinal center, and therefore they have a reduced affinity maturation of the B cell receptor they are carrying. And that means that IL-21 is the important cytokine to regulate B cell responses and to make the fine tuning of, yeah, of the B cell response. So um, they are the important modulators of the response, so of the antigen antibody production as well as on the memory formation. And if you don't have T follicular hypercells, you don't have a germinal center B cell response. That means, yeah, it's a big impact on your body. And since we are interested in studying the B cell responses and the formation of B cell memory, um, we are interested now to study the T follicular hypercells. So coming now back to the T follicular hypercells. So that's our uh, yeah, fully picture of the tifolica hyper cell. So that's characterized by CXR5 as well as high expression of these molecules. But unfortunately, if you want to track tifolica hyper cells, none of these molecules is really uh, a good tool since you don't know if they are permanently high expressed or if they can upregulate it, being upregulated or downregulated. And so it's hard to track a tifolica hyper cells by these molecules, especially since all the other subsets express these molecules. But on the other hand, the cytokine interleukin-21 is quite unique for them, and especially with the, we are interested in these cells that produce this cytokine, since these are the cells that modulate the B cell response. Therefore, Steve came to the idea to generate an interleukin-21 reporter mouse so that we are able to track directly the T cells that give help to the B cells. So this is a construct of the mouse. Between exon 2 and exon 3, there is an iris GFP cassette. We are using these mice on the black 6 background, and we are using them as heterozygous mice. So that means from one allele, they make GFP, since the IL-21 gene is by that uh, disrupted. And from the other allele, they make IL-21. So we have cells that we can track by GFP, but that are still capable to produce IL-21. And the questions I want to focus on with these mouse today in this talk are, are tifolica hypercells heterogeneous? Are they terminally differentiated? Are they able to form memory? And are they plastic on recall? Okay, so first of all, we try to characterize these mice in vitro. So we just taken splenocytes and stimulated them. And here you can see on the x-axis the expression of IL-21 GFP. In blue, you always see a normal black 6 mouse, and in red, an IL-21 reporter mouse. And then you can see if, a, if the splenocytes are stimulated under the neutral conditions, so just with CD3, CD, CD28, that no IL-21 can be seen. But all of these effector subsets not, not just only have their specialized effector cytokines, they also, there are also cytokines existing that promote the differentiation of these different subsets. So like IL-12 is making Th1 cells and IL-4 is making Th2 cells. So therefore we tried, if we stimulate in presence of these cytokines, if we then get some IL-21 production. 
and that you can see here now. So under TH1 and TH2 condition, there's again no IL-21 visible. But if we stimulate our cells either under TH17 conditions or under TFH cell conditions, so with IL-6 or IL-6 in combination with IL-21, a few IL-21 producing cells are visible. Again, under TUEC or TH9 conditions, there are no IL-21 producing cells visible. But in general, it's just really a weak signal and a few cells. So therefore, we, were, we decided to analyze our mouse ex vivo. Um, to do this, we went into the NP-CAL-H system. So NP-CAL-H is just an heptane and the CAL-H is the carrier. We precipitate this antigen in alum and then inject it into the mouse, so to get an immune response, a T-cell-dependent immune response. Afterwards, we analyzed for GFP-positive cells by FAX, by QRT PCR and by immunofluorescence to see where and when we can detect I21 positive cells. So this shows you a typical analysis of some splenocytes of these immunized mice. If we first go to the left panel, then we see a fax of some uh, splenocytes. So here is depicted IL-21. And then you can see by standing for CD4 that within the CD4 positive T cell population, there are some IL-21 producing cells. By further separation of these CD4 cells uh, with CD62L into naive cells and antigen experience cells, you can see that all I21 producing cells are within the antigen experience cells. And furthermore, using the T follicular hypercell markers, CXCR5 and PD1, virtually all of the I21 positive cells are CXCR5 and PD1 high, so they are I20, uh, T follicular hypercells. To confirm that we um, gate or with the GFP on IL-21 positive cells, we separated, activated CD4 positive T cells out of the spleen by fax sorting in either cells that don't express PD-1, CXR5, or that express either PD-1 or CXR5, or both markers together, and that were then GFP negative or GFP positive. And we're just only in the population that were sorted as being GFP positive, where we have also the GFP signal, we find an IL-21 signal. So that means um, we have a good tool where we can track T follicular hypercells by tracking GFP positive cells, and that is really fitting IL-21 signal to GFP signal. Um, so this fact standing already suggested that our cells, our GFP positive cells are T follicular hypercells. So therefore, we also check if the location is fitting, and all our GFP tosses cells can be found in germinal centers. So here stand for in the spleen with GL7 in red, CD3 and GFP, that these T cells inside germinal centers produce IL-21. That means um, in our model, all GFP positive cells are T follicular hypercells, and yeah, we have a good tool to track them. Just to um, show you the typical T follicular hypercell gating, so this is gated on CD4 positive cells, or activated CD4 positive cells, and then we are standing with PD1, CXR5, and we are getting this really high population for PD1, CXR5, and that we call T follicular hypercell. So first of all, we are interested in the kinetics of this cell up on the immunization, at which time point after immunization are they important. So we immunized a large cohort, of the mice with NP -Cal H and tracked the number of the absolute number of T follicular hypercells in the in the spleen on the draining lymph node upon subcutaneous knee injection. And then you can see that as early as three days post immunization, there's an increase in the total cell number. The cell number is peaking around one and two weeks post immunization, and then it's declining. And that's the same for the lymph node. Maybe the decline is a bit delayed. Uh, due to the antigen being present under the skin. But having done this analysis, we realized that if we are getting on T follicular hypercells, that not all of them are IL-21 GFP positive. So just always a proportion of them, or in a proportion of them, IL-21 was able to be detected. So therefore, we're interested at which time point in these kinetics the IL-21 is important. So are the IL-21 producing cells important early in the immunization or at late time points of these immune response? So we also analyzed these numbers of IL-21 positive T-flucker helper cells. And surprisingly, the proportion of IL-21 producing T-flucker helper cells was the same during the whole time point, or 
of the kinetics. So with always being around one third of the T follicular helper cells being I21 positive. So there was completely the same kinetics. So this um, raised the question if both of these, the I21 negative and I21 positive T follicular helper cells, are both T follicular helper cells. And so to confirm this or to answer these questions, we checked for the master regulator of transcription of T follicular helper cells. So what is the expression level of BCL6 in both of these populations? So this shows you in Western blood for BCL6. On the left hand, we have control, set, control populations to so B cell populations. Since germinal center cells shown here in the middle um, are known to have high levels of BCL6, then we get our nice band here. And on the right hand, we put on the Western blood the T cell samples also sorted out of the spleen for MPKL immunized mice. And then you can see here it's naive cells or activated cells that just the T follicular helper cells express BCL6. But additionally, there is no difference in the expression of BCL6 independently if these cells do express I21 or don't express I21. So this is showing that both um, so the I21 negative and I21 positive T follicular hyper cells are bona fide T follicular hyper cells. To confirm this further, we also stained, stained uh, for, or the, for some other markers that are known to be highly expressed on T follicular helper cells like ICOS, BTLA, CD200, and DL7. And again, there was no difference between I21 negative and I21 positive T follicular helper cells. So confirming again that both of these cells are bona fide T follicular helper cells. Lastly, we were interested if both of these subcells show the same or can co-opt the same characteristics from TH2 and TH1 cells. So we sorted again our cells and checked by QRT PCR for TH2 characteristics seen at the left hand, so with the effector cytokine IL4 and the transcription factor SCATA3, or on the right hand uh, for TH1 characteristics, so interferon gamma and TBET. And then you can see that both of the T follicular helper cells are able to express IL4, and this relies on low but comparable expression of GATA3. On the other hand, just GFP, so IL21 positive T follicular helper cells, are able to express interferon gamma, and that you can also see is due to um, the expression of TBET that is more or less missing in GFP negative T follicular helper cells. So that means in our TH2 biased NPKLH immunization, both of the subsets have comparable expression of IL4. But yeah, there's a distinguishing in, in the gamma expression. So what happens if we would infect our mice with a TH1 biased system? So therefore we also infected our reporter mice with influenza, so a TH1 biased infection system. And now in fact staining, we're staining for the cytokines, IL4 on the x-axis and interferon gamma on the y-axis as well for the GATA3 and TBET. And now you can see in this TH1 biased infection system, both of the TFH cell groups, so here the GFP negative and the GFP positive cells, show now comparable expression of interferon gamma, so an opposite to the TH2 biased systems. But no IL-4 can be detected. And this is now correlated with the comparable expression of TBET. So to summarize this first part, so, the heterogene so there's heterogeneity amongst T follicular helper cells. So we did show that expression of IL-21 is in a, can be seen in a proportion of TFH phenotype cells. There's comparable expression of BCL6 and surface molecules related to TFH phenotype cells. <coughs> and these cells can co-express other uh, TH transcription factors and cytokines. So more or less by this, we've shown the f really first time that a TFH cell can co-express IL-21 with further cytokines. So that means our first question we have answered, T follicular helper cells show heterogeneity. But coming to the next questions, terminal differentiation. One feature of being terminal differentiated means to lack uh, to lack the ability to, to, to proliferate. Therefore, first of all, we, un, we wanted to know if T follicular helper cells still can proliferate. To answer this question, we immunized black 6 mice with NPKLH and started to feed them by BRDU either 9, 11, or 13 days post the immunization. 
on day 14, so the peak of the immune response, we analyzed for the proportion of BRDO positive cells. So that means by start of 9, 11, or 13 days post immunization, these cells have been either incorporated by DRU for one, three, or five days. And then you can see independently of the starting time point of BRDU injection that always the T follicular helper cells, so the gray bars here, shown here in gray bars, have the highest proportion of BRDU positive cells. So that would suggest that T follicular helper cells can proliferate. On the other hand, with this experiment, you can't distinguish if T follicular helper cells per se proliferate or if the precursors are highly proliferating. To distinguish between these two possibilities, we also performed DNA content analysis. So at day 10 post NPKLH immunization, we sorted CD4 positive T cells and performed the PI staining to analyze them, the cells for DNA content, and checked all cells that are uh, bigger than 2N and that are then cycling CD4 positive cells. And then you can see again that T follicular helper cells have the highest proportion of cycling. Of cycling. Uh, so that means T follicular helper cells per se proliferate. And additionally, there is no difference between I21 negative and I21 positive T follicular helper cells. So both of these populations are able to proliferate. So, but then is the question, why do we have these two populations? So one possibility would be that the I21 negative T follicular helper cells are the precursors of the I21 positive cells. To test this, we wanted to have our reporter on a T-cell receptor transgenic system to track cells that are all in the same status of activation. So we crossed our reporter to OT2 mice, and this is just the protocol. So we transferred a few of these CD4 positive splenocytes into congenic naive mice. These mice have then been immunized with OVA and alum, and to, to then inside seven days, this means we have generated T follicular helper cells in vivo. So these T follicular helper cells have been FAC sorted in either being T follicular helper cells that are I21 negative and I, or I21 positive. They have additionally been labeled with a cell division dye that's called CTV and transferred into naive mice again that we are then boosted with O1 alum and six days later, later we have analyzed these cells. And one of these analyses you can see on the left hand, uh, on the right side. Um, on the left hand, you can see cells that have been transferred as being GFP negative T follicular helper cells. And on the right hand, you can see cells that have been transferred as being GFP positive T follicular helper cells. And, oops. and then you can see cells that have been transferred as being GFP negative show again a proportion of uh, GFP positive T follicular helper cells. In opposite, cells that have been transferred as being GFP positive show a relatively stable expression profile. So the majority of these cells is still GFP positive. And additionally, you can follow this up by the cell division. You can see that cells early upregulate GFP. So within this population, there are some spots of GFP positive cells already early in the proliferation. Whereas these GFP positive cells maintain uh, the ability to express IL-21 that seems to be uh, relatively stable over several rounds of division, but in the end they also can downregulate GFP. So this suggests that IL-21 negative T follicular helper cells can give rapidly or fast give rise to GFP positive cells, whereas the GFP expression profile seems to be quite stable. So what is with memory? Um, are T follicular helper cells able to form memory? So to answer these questions, we wanted to transfer either conventional effector cells or GFP negative T follicular helper cells or GFP positive T follicular <coughs> helper cells and check uh, for their recall response. If these populations, since it's known that effector cells are able to make a recall response, but are these populations able to recall again uh, two like the effector cells? So to do this, we used the influenza infection system. Um, so at the peak of the T follicular hyper cell number, so day 10 to 12, post influenza infection, we sorted CD4 positive T cells out of the spleen of these mice. And these spleen, uh, four populations that have been sorted are either sorted have been either naive cells 
or conventional effector cells, so CD44 positive cells that were CXCR5 negative, or we've sorted CXCR5 positive T follicular hypercells that did not express GFP or that did express GFP. So these four populations were separated and injected into different naive mice. And these ones were allowed to rest for five weeks so that these cells can form memory cells. After five, five weeks, we checked in these mice if these cells persisted. And some other mice of the, of the groups were reinfected. And eight, eight, late, eight days later, we checked if these cells can be recalled. So all the next plots I'm going to show you is always the analysis of these transferred LIF5.2 positive cells inside the LIF5.1 congenic host. Uh, this shows you the analysis of absolute numbers that, of cells that can be found back in either the spleen or in the lymph node. And at the left, always the day 32 data, so the persistence data, and here the recall data. And then you can see that all of these four, four groups, so the cells of all the four groups, persist. They are quite ex uh, in low numbers, but all of them exist, and they are, have comparable numbers. So all of them can persist, and that's the same in the lymph node. On the other hand, what happens after the re-exposure to the antigen? Then you can see that there's more or less no change in the naive group. So these naive groups, like expected, they can't expand. But on the other hand, all of these three effector groups can expand. So that means since the T-flicker hypercells show at least as many cells as the conventional effector cells, that these cells are able to recall up on reinfection. So they are able to form uh, functional memory cells. Yeah, and that's again this case for the lymph node. But what is the phenotype of these cells? So first of all, we checked what is the phenotype of the cells of the persistence data or time point. So therefore, we separated our cells in T effector memory cells and T central memory cells by C62L. And then you can see that all of them give rise around to 10% to T Effect central memory cells and 90% to T effector memory cells. So um, confirming again that T follicular hypercells give rise to functional memory T cells. So now we know the persistence is completely comparable, uh, but what is with the phenotype of the recalled cells? So more or less the question is, if all T follicular hypercells that give rise to a memory cell are later again T follicular hypercells. <coughs> Um, so this shows you the analysis of these recalled cells. The upper panels show the analysis of the spleen and the lower of the lymph node. And so that is uh, gated for six year, oh, stained for CXR5 and PD1. These are the primary responding host CD4 cells. And these three panels show you the, uh, pheno the, show you the phenotype of these recalled cells. So either so of the cells that have been transferred as effector cells, as GFP negative T follicular hypercells, or as GFP positive T follicular hypercells. And then you can see that cells that have been transferred as conventional effector cells are more or less, have more or less the same capability to produce T follicular hypercells, uh, like primary, the first time responding, naive CD4 cells. So there's no disadvantage in being a, a memory cell. But on the other hand, cells that have been transferred as being TFH cells show a higher proportion of CXR5 PD1 double positive cells than conventional effector cells. And this is even a, there's even an increase from GFP negative to GFP positive T follicular hypercells visible. So this shows that they are biased to give rise to T follicular hyper memory cell, or to, to, to T follicular hypercells, but on the other hand, not all of them or the majority of these cells are conventional effector cells. So, but maybe these, they have just changed the phenotype, but they are still T follicular hypercells. So therefore, we checked also the expression of BCL6 in these recalled cells. And then you can see <coughs> that the expression of BCL6 still correlates to TFH cell phenotype, since just all of these cells that are PD1, CXR5, double high, uh, are BCL6 positive. So this shows you the BCL6 expression in always these three populations, so the gray area is the CXR5 negative population, the dotted line is the CXR5 intermediate population, and the black line is the BCL6 expression in these T flicker helper cells. So that means that these 
T follicular hypercells upon recall can give rise to conventional effector cells and not just to T follicular hypercells that have changed their phenotype. Since, yeah, BCS6 still correlates to TFH phenotype. Um, so, if these T follicular hypercells are able to give rise to memory cells and also give a, are able to give rise to conventional effector cells, can they then also? Um, fulfill completely different functions, so move to non-lymphoid organs and be there as an effector cell. So to answer this question, we also analyze the lung, so a non-lymphoid organ of these infected mice. And also here you can see that all of the three transferred effector cell groups are able to proliferate. Uh, yeah, but the phenotype of these cells is depicted here. And then you can see that none of these cells is expressing CXCR5, so none of these cells has a TFH cell phenotype. So that is confirming further that a T follicular hyper cell can give rise to a conventional memory or con to a conventional factor cell. And lastly, in this experiment, we are interested to ask the question if the IL21 expression profile is reproduced on recall. So if you first focus on the left side where the lymphoid organs are depicted, you can see that the cells that have been transferred as being conventional effector cells, or the cells that have been transferred as GFP negative T follicular helper cell, give rise to a sm small proportion, so maybe again around one third of, T of GFP positive cells. On the other hand, cells that have been transferred as being GFP positive keep on this a quite high proportion in the spleen and especially in the lymph node of being GFP positive. So this is, again, like resembling the OT2 experiment, that showing that the I21 expression profile, profile seems to be quite stable. So what happens in the lung, the non-lymphoid organ? Then you can see that the GFP-expressing cells are more or less absent in the cells that have been transferred as effector cells and GFP-negative cells. On the other hand, there can be still found some we found some GFP-expressing cells in the population that has been transferred as GFP-positive, but even here, uh, the proportion compared to the lymphoid organs of being GFP-positive is dramatically reduced. To summarize this more or less this experiment, so all of these three effector subgroups can give rise to uh, memory cells. Um, a conventional effector cell give mainly, so it's shown here with this sick error, uh, rise to conventional effector cells, despite some of them can develop into T follicular helper cells. An I21 negative T follicular helper cell gives all, can all rise to conventional effector cells, but now to a larger proportion to T follicular helper cell. And in both of these cases, cases, cases these T follicular helper cells again give rise to around a third of I21 positive T follicular helper cells, that's our normal um, standard ratio. But an I21 positive T follicular helper cell gives, uh, again, rise to conventional effector cell, but also now to a larger proportion into to T follicular helper cell. And then all of these T follicular helper cells up, up on recall I21 positive. So this is the case. So this is the case in lymphoid organs. But all of these cells can also um, give rise, to, well, fulfill a function as um, recalled cells in non-lymphoid organs, and then they are all conventional effector cells. To summarize this second and last part, so the fate and memory formation of T follicular helper cells, we did show that T follicular helper cells can proliferate, that I21 negative cells can act fast as precursor for I21 positive cells. Um, both of these populations can give rise to functional memory effector cells, and the re-exposure of antigen reveals plasticity in these T follicular helper cells. So T follicular helper cells are not terminal differentiated. They show plasticity, and they show ability to form memory. Yeah, so taken together, all our conclusions are, again, T flick hyper cells are heterogeneous, not terminally differentiated, can give rise to memory cells, and are flexible effector cells that show plasticity. Yeah, and all of this work was done in David's lab with help of all the nice uh, lab members, and Steve was <coughs> constructing and generating the mouse. I had help from Axel, was getting antibody from Lynn, and virus from Gabriel.
Great job, Katya. So there's plenty of time for, uh, for questions. Yeah. Yes, no, you. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you guys look at the localization of 21 producers and non producing TFHs within lymphonodus bleed? Or how? We haven't finished that. Since it's always, if we stay in the CFP, then you don't have to pick the, uh, yeah, yeah, you have to go stand, but we haven't finished this analysis. But we have done some. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, a similar question, of course, arises to, as to what distinguishes then those producing R21 from those that are not, something in their physical location, for example? Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe we should have rehearsed this a bit before we, uh, before we took it on the road. So do you think the R21 producers are mostly inside germinal centers or outside? For so the R21 producers are all inside the germinal center. And there can be additionally, there are additional T cells inside the germinal center that don't produce GFP. Um, but I wouldn't exclude that there are some T flicker hepa cells that are just outside the germinal center, maybe that are on their way inside. But this is just a theory, and I'm not completely sure, uh, so I can't prove it by stainings. Since there are some reports that the TFH cells are generated outside the germinal center, and therefore maybe they move in the germinal into the germinal center and just on their way they upregulate I21, or once they are inside, so now on the way they can't since there are no positive cells around. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So. Uh, so then, the only the only remaining um, question to answer is. No, oh, I'm getting confused. So most of your 21 producers are within German. They are all within German centers. Why don't we just leave that at that point? For the moment, <laughs> it seems to be a bit murky. So maybe I could ask you. Oh no, it's Anna. Um, there's not the possibility of monoallelic expression since if we are sorting these cells, then they just have one allele for IL-21 and form for GFP, but all GFP sorted ones are IL-21 producers and none of the GFP negative cells is producing IL-21. So, so both alleles are together active. Yes, yeah, since if I'm sorting GFP negative T flicker hyper cells, none of these is expressing R21. So by that we know that both alleles have to be active together. Do you know that those um, R21 producing cells you saw in the lung on a um, rate challenge infection, did they localize to and uh, induce into the tissues or were they really like in the airways? Or? Uh, what, what we haven't done histology with the lung, just the fuck staining. That's a good question. Yeah. I just want to make a thought that fuel producers of IL-21 and the gamma, for example, do they help drive the ISIS type switching of the plasma cells in terms of IgE, IgE1, IgG3? Probably yes. Um. <coughs> Maybe you reviewed our paper, since that was one of the specific questions we, we were asked. And it's actually very difficult to, to work out a way in which to do that, to make the t flicker helper cells deficient in producing a soluble molecule uh, and then determine that effect. So we attempted that and not with a lot of success, since virtually any cell can make gamma interferon, for example, and it will affect switching inside or surrounding entry into the germinal center. So in the end, we had the correlation that the more t flicker hyper cells make a different gamma, the better was the switching. But we also had the opposite case that you just can transfer all knockout CD4 cells, and the interferon gamma produced by the CD8 cells is sufficient to make the switching. So we have results for both explanations or both ways. Yeah. Uh, just a 
point of clarification, did your reporter insertion actually block aisle 21 message from that allele? Because you put it in between exons, right? Mm -hmm. Does it mess up the splicing or something? So you don't get you don't get an aisle 21 transcript from that allele. I Is that we don't get. So you couldn't analyze the hom homozygous mouse, for example, because it wouldn't produce aisle 21. Can I pass it to Steve? <laughs> Well, in the first uh, mice that we had, we took mice that were putative homozygous and they behave, those cells behave exactly like R21 deficient, bona fide deficient uh, uh, cells. So there's no detectable functional R21 coming from them. They have exactly the same phenotype, for example, of hyper IgE and diminished IgG1. Test the ability to form memory cells when you transfer them. Upon reinfection, what was the outcome of the actual reinfection in terms of like viral tears and also what was the, the nature of the immune response? So was it B cells or was it, was it T cell memory that they were developing to? Or? So we haven't checked for virus titer. Um. Because you'd expect that if it was a memory response, they'd actually be able to clear it a lot faster than the primary. Yeah, we haven't checked for virus title of how yeah. far, how long it would take, or to compare that we haven't killed the mice and to check when they would, like when they would clear it. Yeah. So we just had this one time point uh, to analyze the cells, but not to check how fast they would be able to clear the infection. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, it's just on two o'clock, and I just ask you to join me in thanking Katja for a great talk and a great. <laughs>